Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And that's eternal life, people. This a Bible study is going to be called the Gospel. Uh... The gospel? What is the gospel? Well, let's find out what the Bible has to say about that. Let's go to the book of Mark, and we'll go to chapter 1 and verse 1. And oh, by the way, it's February 28, 2020. You know, when you've got Jesus, you got 2020 vision, right? Uh, or maybe even better. But uh, it's the uh, Sabbath day, supposedly. And uh, anybody wants to keep the Sabbath? I think it's a great thing, keeping the Sabbath. You know, taking work six days and take one day off and reflect upon what the Lord has done for us. And, uh, you know, learn things of the Lord. Uh, I think it's a great thing. But uh, then again, yeah, I usually try to do Bible studies on the Sabbath day. Uh, that's what I usually try to do. So am I breaking the Sabbath by doing Bible studies on the Sabbath day? I don't know. Some people would say yes and you know, if you're doing the Lord's work on the Sabbath day, is it really work? I don't think it is. But let's read Mark chapter 1. The beginning of the gospel. Ah, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance, the baptism of he preached the baptism of repentance for the remissions of for the remission of sins. Wow. Verse 5. And there came out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair. Hmm. Wow. John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of a skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. Can you imagine if John the Baptist showed up at a Baptist church clothed in camel's hair? They would probably lock the door. Get out of here, you homeless bum! And Jesus said that uh, of all those born of women, there was not a greater than John the Baptist. Yeah. Verse 7. And preached. Who preached? John the Baptist. And preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I have indeed baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Ah, yep. We're supposed to be baptized with water, but Christ is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John and Jordan, and straightway coming out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit like a dove descending 
upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So John saw a spirit like a dove descend upon him. That was one of the first, well, that might have been the very first acknowledgement that uh, Christ was the Son of God. Now, what did John, let's see, in uh, John was talking about telling the people to repent. Well, what's up with that? Well, in Mark 1 and verse 4, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, what does remission say mean? I mean, let's face it. If you had cancer and you got treated, and by no means do I trust radiation, chemotherapy, uh, and, and I'm not crazy about surgery either for cancer, but uh, if, you were, if you had cancer and it was in remission, that means it's not eating you alive. So... The remission of sins, repentance for the remission of sins. Now, there are people that will try to confuse the issue of what repentance means. Very famous pastor out in Arizona is one of them. Who will tell you it means to change your mind about your unbelief. Repentance means to change your unbelief in God to belief in God. Okay. Is that really what it means? Well, in the book of James, chapter 2 and verse 19, James writes, Thou believest that there is one God? Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So does repent mean to change your unbelief? Well, let's take a look. Now, the thing is, God, when he repents of something, it might be that he's sorrowful that something's happening that he allowed. Perhaps, you know, the Lord created Satan good, and then Satan fell. Is God kind of sorry that he made Satan? Perhaps, perhaps not. I'm not saying he is, but the thing is, in Genesis 6, God repented that he had made man because the whole world had turned evil. And if you don't know what happened in Genesis 6, take a look at my playlist on my homepage, The Angels That Sinned, probably over 10 hours of study. It's well worth your time to really understand. It's one of the two keys to understanding the Bible. So, but we cannot compare our repentance with the Lord's repentance. We are fallen creatures full of sin. God the Father is not. There is a big difference. You know, in 2 Peter verse 3 and 9, <laughs> and people that hate Paul will tell you that this doesn't belong in the Bible. Yeah, this doesn't belong in the Bible, the, their gospel. In 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. You ever heard of a slacker? Uh, that's somebody that doesn't pull their own weight, somebody that doesn't do what they're supposed to do. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay? So, what is repentance? Well, let's take a look at the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and verse 5. 
Remember wherefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent. Uh, how can you fall except for you were up somewhere? You know, you got to be up somewhere to fall, right? So, remember therefore from whence thou art falling, and repent, and do the first works. Works, their deeds. And do the first works, or else I will come up unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. Revelation 2 and verse 21. And I gave her space to repent of her unbelief? No. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication? And she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their unbelief? No. Except they repent of their deeds. Huh. Revelation 3.19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Boy, I tell you what, God must really, really, really love me. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Revelation 9, 20 and verse 21. Revelation 9, verse 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, neither which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murderers, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. I guess, you know, I guess they um, they don't believe, right? Yeah. Now, when man needs to repent, he needs to repent of his wickedness. And let me tell you something, people. When you truly do believe in the Lord, you'll, you're going to have a change of heart. I mean, it's just, it's going to happen. Uh I think Peter's here in Acts 8 and verse 22. He's talking to a saucer. And he tells him, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness. Huh. Repent of his wickedness? Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Okay, I, you know, does it mean to just change your mind? Yeah, change your mind about sin. That's what repentance means. Very important. Now, in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, we read, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Do you know that the goodness of God leads us to repentance of our wickedness? Think about that, people. All right. All right, now, in Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now, after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So God wants us to turn from our un unrighteousness and unfruitful works and believe. Believe what? Believe the gospel. You know, Jesus said, believe the, uh, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. 
if you believe the gospel and you know that's that's how you get into the kingdom of god it looks like so let's take a look at mark chapter 8 and verse 35 jesus speaking for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Now, he's talking about losing your physical life, but saving your spiritual life. Eternal life. Well, how about the book of Matthew, chapter 4 and verse 23? And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing, ah, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Matthew 9, 35, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Very interesting. The gospel is healing. Sometimes it's physical healing with sickness and disease, but most certainly it's the healing of our spiritual disease, our separation from God and his kingdom, as we will see later. Well, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples. He departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, the works of Christ, in other words, his miracles, he sent two of his disciples. Now why did he send two? Because there's a verse in the Bible that says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, shall everything be established. That's why you have the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. So, he sent two of his disciples. John is sending two of his disciples to go talk to the Christ. Verse 3, And said unto him, Art thou he that should come? Or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight. Very important. The blind receive their sight. And the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. You know, people, leprosy is an absolutely horrible disease. Um, in the 19, late 1950s and early 1960s, America had less than, I think, one or two dozen cases of leprosy in the entire country. I mean, you're talking over 100 million people. And then we started allowing Haitians from the island of Haiti coming to the United States, and, uh, you know, Haiti. Uh, Haiti's the land of where voodoo comes from, and the legend of zombies. Yeah, that's where it all comes from. And in Dade County, Florida, which Miami is in Dade County, Florida, they had, they today have more cases of leprosy in just Miami-Dade County alone than the entire United States had in the late 1950s and early 60s before we had all these 
so-called refugees coming from Haiti. Leprosy turns your skin like paper white. So your skin will turn paper white with le leprosy and your fingers and toes will just fall off. I mean, it's a horrible disease. Matter of fact, in the book of Leviticus, uh, when somebody would be diagnosed, when one of the Levitical priests, the Levites, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, the priest tribe, would uh, diagnose somebody with leprosy, they would kick them out of the camp. That's where the idea of quarantine comes from. It comes from the Old Testament, the books of Moses. I mean, it goes back that far. Um, you know, they were, they were to be kicked out. So, leprosy, horrible disease. But in Matthew 11 and verse 5, Jesus says, The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. You know, I just thought of something here. Why is it the poor have the gospel preached to them? What about the rich? <laughs> we'll cover that in a second. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Are you offended in Jesus? In Matthew 19, 23, Then Jesus said unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why is that? Because rich people depend upon their money. They love their money more than they love the things of God, generally. Verse 24, And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And you know there's preachers that'll tell you that the eye of a needle was a gate in Jerusalem that when you were riding a camel going through it that you had to duck down a little bit, you know, to clear it. And that was going through the eye of a needle. That's what they'll tell you what it means. Yeah, you just got to duck down just a little bit, you know. Bow yourself down just a little bit when you're taking your camel through. I don't believe that for a minute. I think, uh, ladies, those of you that are done sewing, you know what the eye of a needle is. And I do too. I was in the army um, where I didn't have mom to... Uh, sew buttons on my uh, uniforms. So, what can I tell you? Nope. People that love money more than they love God? What can I tell you? In Matthew 24, 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. What nations? I believe it's the nations of Israel, but, you know, if somebody wants to believe different, that's, that's all right. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. All right, let's take a look at Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Now, I believe this is where uh, John had just baptized him. The Spirit came down like a dove. We'd read that earlier. I believe this is where it takes, that's, this is a continuation of that. Jesus had just been baptized by John. So Luke 4, chapter 4, verse 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. That's going to be the future of the church one day, people, the wilderness. Uh, those of you that are waiting on the pre-trib rapture, you're going to be disappointed. Trust me, um, your pastor's been lying to you. 
either intentionally or being misled. Yeah, I know, because I know what my uh, Bible cemetery taught. I, I mean, I'm sorry, my Bible seminary, Bible college, Bible school. Yeah, I think I was right the first time, cemetery. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. Why 40 days? Well, wasn't didn't it rain with Noah 40 days and 40 nights? 40, that's, that's one of those numbers in the Bible that pops up a lot. Being 40 days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat, he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God. Oh, yeah. Let me. This is. The devil's famous for this stuff. He'll. Uh, the devil knows scriptures, but he'll misapply them if he doesn't outright lie. And the devil said unto him, If, if. If thou be the Son of God, command the stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, and Jesus answered him, saying, It is written. See, when you're under attack by the devil, it's always good to quote scripture to him. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into an high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. You know, Jesus came down from heaven. Can you imagine the kingdoms of this world, how they must have paled in comparison to where Christ came from? Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see, uh, devil. I had a Mercedes-Benz. And you want to give me a 25-year-old rusted-out Ford? Uh, I don't think so. The devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a mountain of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to who, whomsoever I will, I give it. Yeah, you know, uh, Satan must have had a lease from the Lord. You know, uh, I don't know for how long, but uh, there's probably some truth to this. But uh, the lease is running out, people. In Revelation 12, 12, we read, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Oh, yeah. Back to Luke 4 and verse 6. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, if thou therefore therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence, for it is written, oh yeah, Satan can quote scripture, people. He quotes scripture. He, Satan knows scripture better than probably 98% of all the church people in this world. I hope I'm part of that 1% or 2%, but... Uh, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands shall they bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. 
And Jesus answering, and uh, Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Ah, so Satan departs from him for a season. Well, until the crucifixion, right? Verse 14, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit unto, into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Listen carefully. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. All right, let's read verse 22. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Oh yeah, hey, this guy, isn't this guy the, the carpenter's son? I mean, what does this guy know? You know, I mean, that's the Bob translation. Verse 23. And he said unto them, Jesus replying, right? Ye shall surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also hear in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Boy, ain't that the truth. But I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias. Uh, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months. When great famine was throughout all the land. Now there's a story about this. In the Old Testament, there was a woman that had a little bit of meal and a little bit of oil. And, uh, I mean, just enough to make a couple of small little pieces of bread. And you know what? The prophet asked her to make him a little cake. Maybe something as small as a cracker. I don't know. And guess what? He stayed with her, and the whole time, her food supply never ran out. Oh, yeah. But I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up the three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisus the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naamah, Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogues, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him under the brow of the hill, whereupon, whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he passed through the midst of them, went his way. See, people, 
They don't like Jesus. They, they're not going to like us that preach or teach Jesus. I mean, that's just the way it is. I mean, can you imagine this? This Jesus did all kinds of miracles and told them the truth, and they didn't want to hear it because everybody wants to be self-righteous. And trust me, I have absolutely nothing to be self-righteous about. Absolutely nothing. Pride is one thing that uh, you can't really charge me with. I got a lot of other faults, but pride is not one of them. Now, in Matthew 3 and verse 11, John said, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, uh, fire, I did a very, uh, well, not a very detailed study, but a more detailed study. Uh, for the wicked, fire is not something very good. But believe it or not, believers are going to be baptized with fire too. And your unfruitful works are going to be burned up. So I'm going to be uh, get some a lot of things burned up in the fire, I'm sure. So let's take a look at fire. Now, I did a Bible study on fire. You could do a search and find it, I'm sure. In Luke 12, 49, Jesus said, I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I? if it be already kindled. Huh. Now in 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8, we read, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not, obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Huh. Huh. Isn't that interesting? Now, in uh, the book of... Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, every man's work, every man's work, and that includes you ladies too, because women, woman, the woman was taken out of man, so that's why you're called a woman, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Huh. So even believers are going to be, we're going to have fire. We're going to be baptized with fire. If you got good works, they'll, they'll be standing after the fire goes through. If you got uh, bad works, they're going to be burned up. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yet so as we as yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? Oh yeah, and there's a group, two groups in the uh, Israeli state that want to rebuild a temple. Want to build a temple. Not for Jesus. No, they want to build it for their Messiah. The Temple Mount Institute and the Temple Mount Faithful. I think, well, it's the Temple Institute and the Temple Mount Faithful. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Oh, yeah. So, now I'm sure everybody's read and knows this story. John chapter 3. But we're going to read it anyways because it ties in. John 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees 
named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now the Pharisees were a denomination of the Jews. Verse 2, the same came to Jesus by night. And why does he come to Jesus by night? Maybe because he didn't want everybody to recognize that he was going to talk to Jesus. After all, the, uh, the, the top leaders of the Pharisees, uh, they wouldn't listen to Jesus. So that's my theory. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, and of the Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You want to enter into the kingdom of God? You've got to be born of the Spirit, people. Now, what does it mean being born of water? Well, some churches will say, well, you know, you've got to have water baptism. Got to be baptized with water. And then they'll argue, well, you know, sprinkled or dunked, immersed. That's possible. But have you ever heard the saying when a pregnant woman says that her water broke? Um, could that be what they're referring to, except a man be born of water? Could be. But being born of the water is not as important as being born of the Spirit. Except a man be born of water, the flesh, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Now that word wind, breath, and spirit all come from the same Greek word, pneuma. It's where you get the word pneumatic, like pneumatic tools, air tools. Uh, they use air tools in places where electricity, uh, where you have water and electricity would be dangerous to use. That's where they use air tools. Pneuma, wind, breath, spirit. You know, when God breathed into Adam the breath of life, that's what it's referring to. Although the New Testament was written in Greek and the Hebrew was for the Old Testament, but the thought is along the same lines. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell where, whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and we receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven... And who came down from heaven? Christ. Even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. I guess we should keep reading. This is a really good chapter. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that's an interesting story in and of itself, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You want to have eternal life? You've got to believe in him and be born again of the Spirit. 
verse 16. Probably the most famous verse the world, even the world knows this verse. For God so loved the world. Loved, past tense. You think God loves this world? Well, let's take a look at that real quick. Well, let's take a look at 1 John 2.15. John says, love not the world. What? But, it's, but the Bible says, for God so loved, loved, loved the world. But 1 John 2, 5, 15 says, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. John 15, 19. If ye were of the world... The world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Now wait a minute. So let's go back to John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Loved, past tense. What world did God love? The world, the Garden of Eden before the fall. That's the world that God loved. God wants to take the world before the fall and turn it back to that. That's why Christ came. That's the gospel. He wants us, the earth, to be like what heaven was before the fall. Well, let's take a look at the Lord's Prayer real quick. The one in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Thy kingdom come. When's the kingdom going to come? When Christ returns, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Yeah, there's going to be a day that the way things are in heaven are going to be the same on earth. Thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's some good advice. So let's go back to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, the world before Sin entered into the world, but world before death came. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. The modern versions get rid of only begotten. And they'll say his one and only Son. But then, when you look in, uh, I think it's Luke chapter 1, it says that Adam was a son of God. So, how can Christ be the one and only Son when Adam is also called the Son of God? See, they do that stuff on purpose. But the King James makes it quite clear. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Adam was a Son of God, yes, but he wasn't the only begotten Son you want to know what the word begotten means, look it up in Webster's 1828 Dictionary. It means of the same essence as of the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. And for that, you, the you-know-whos you know tried to kill him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, 
But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name. What name? Yeshua HaMashiach? No. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth trust, I'm sorry, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. All right, let's read from Acts chapter 1. Verse 1. Acts 1.1. 1, 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up. All right, this is after the crucifixion. Three days later, Christ rose from the dead, and he was taken up into heaven. Right? After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days. Remember, Christ was taken into the wilderness after he was baptized of John and the Holy Spirit descended upon him forty days. Noah, 40 days. Jesus hung out with uh, his disciples for 40 days. Hmm, coincidence, I'm sure, right? To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining, pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of God. The Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Ah, see, God promised a kingdom to Israel. You know, when you look at the New Jerusalem coming down from heaven, it's got 12 gates. And guess what's on those 12 gates? The names of the 12 tribes of Israel. So, you know what? Is there a 13th gate for the Gentiles? Uh, if there is, I can't find it. What can I tell you? Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he saith unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. So Christ went up into heaven in the clouds, and he's gonna, when he comes back, he's going to come in the clouds. So keep that in mind. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. All right, let's go to chapter 2. All right, chapter 2. Verse 1, 
And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, you know, uh, one of these days I might do a study on the um, holy days of the Lord. There's a weekly Sabbath, but you've got the, the holy days. You've got Pentecost, you've got Tabernacles, you've got Passover, Unleavened Bread, the week of Unleavened Bread. You've got some, and you can see the gospel and the plan of salvation in these holy days. It would make a very interesting study. Um, but uh, I'm not, I just, I mean, I have them familiar with them, but I just don't feel qualified to teach them because I haven't studied them as extensively as I feel I would need to to really present it and do it justice properly. I don't know. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. There's that spirit, right? Wind, breath, spirit as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as of fire. There's that fire again. And it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now people, when, when they were given tongues... You could read later that they were speaking in languages that people could understand because not everybody spoke the same languages. You had people from Greece. You had people from Rome. The people in Rome spoke Latin. The people from Greece spoke Greek. Uh, they were all speaking to them in their own languages. You know, they I, I don't think they were speaking gibberish like they do in some of these other churches that talk about tongues. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we, every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians. You know what? Parthians, uh, the Parthian Empire was a contemporary of Rome, and the Rome tried to conquer Parthians and didn't do a very good job. Uh, and you know what? Parthia was uh, has been to almost totally deleted from our history books. Take a look at the Parthian Empire. Some people think that they were uh, part of uh, divorced, scattered Israel. I don't know. We'll find out one day. But hey, the Lord's having them preach to the Parthians. Verse 9, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontius and Asia, uh, Par Pargia and Pamphylia in Egypt, and the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now, in Acts 20 and verse 24, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto me, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel, the gospel of the grace of God. Ah, so the gospel has reference to healing, the kingdom of God, and grace. Grace, people. You know, there are Baptists especially that teach uh, dispensations. It's a word that appears four times in the Bible, but they write this entire huge book and say there's seven dispensations. How they get that out of a word that appears four times in the Bible, I, I can't figure it out. 
But Moses was given the dispensation of law, and Christ gave us the dispensation of grace. Dispensation has reference to give something, to dispense. You ever heard of a soap dispenser? Well, that's what dispensation has reference to. Moses was given the law. Christ gave us grace. You know, it's not periods of time like the Baptists teach. I just don't get it, you know. I mean... You know, this is what's uh, this is what's so messed up about churches. I mean, they will they major on the minors and minor on the majors. And I'm telling you what, people, the grace of Jesus Christ is the gospel. One of aspects of the gospel. All right. In Romans 1 and verse 16, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And we're talking about the real Jews. We're not talking about the synagogue of Satan of Revelation 2 and verse 9. No. In first, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter four, verse one. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, thank God for mercy, people. As we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves. And there's people who will tell you that Paul's preaching about himself. No. For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for, Christ, for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen to that. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8 and 9, But though we or an angel from heaven, oh boy, somebody tell this to the Mormons, you know, they, they teach that a, an angel called Moron I, yeah, moron, M-O-R-O-N, and they put an I on the end, moron I, of course they call him moron I, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Did you know Mormons are cursed because they preach another gospel? Another testament of Jesus, they say. The Book of Morons. I mean, the Book of Mormons. I was right the first time. Here's something for the Paul haters, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed 
with that Holy Spirit of promise. Wow. All right, let's go to John chapter 20, verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. Now, this is after the crucifixion. I mean, everybody thinks, oh, Jesus is dead. That's it, right? We have seen the Lord. But he, Thomas, said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst of them, and I'm sorry, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And no, Thomas was not just saying an expression there. You know, when somebody, uh, you know, like when, uh, like when a parents tell a kid, oh, you know, when you graduate from high school, I'm going to buy you a new car. Kid comes home from graduation, finds a new car parked in the, the uh, drive when he goes, oh my God. No, no, that's, that's not what Thomas is saying here. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. See, those that have not seen Christ and yet believe are blessed. Oh, yeah. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10, but, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior... Savior from what? Death, people. By the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, not physical death, spiritual death, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Praise the Lord for that, people. All right. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 17, oh boy, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Do you know in the Old Testament what that word is, the house of God? Bethel. That's what Bethel is. It's house of God. When you hear people called Beth, it's the Hebrew word for house. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, ooh, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Do you know there's people that obey not the gospel of God? Oh, yeah. All right, let's get ready to close this out. Revelation chapter 14. All right, let's read Revelation 14, verses 1 through 7. And we'll close this out. And I looked, him, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. I think I'd rather have the father's name written in my forehead rather than the mark of the beast, but hey, that's just me. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. You ever heard that, uh, where they say, yeah, we're going to be up in heaven uh, with angel wings and a halo and playing our harps in the clouds? I don't know how true that is, but uh, I don't know. Verse 3. 
And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. For these are they which were not defiled with women. Oh, that counts me out. Um, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now, ladies don't get the idea that uh, just because a guy's married, uh, women have defiled him. That's not what this is saying at all. No. But you know what? How many men and women are both virgins on their wedding night? I would dare say probably not one in 10,000 in the West anyways. Um, I know I wasn't a virgin on my wedding night. That's for sure. But, uh, you know, I don't know. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. They, these were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel. Why is the gospel everlasting? Because it's going to be forever, people. Everlasting life. Eternal life. Having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Good advice. Fear God and give glory to him. Well, that's the end. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the wor uh, world and his Father, God the Father. In Jesus' precious name, amen.